Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an episode of the Truffle Tales podcast, where it's my job to tease out stories of inspiration, wisdom and helpful bits of advice from truffle hunters and mushroom experts and enthusiasts from around the world, helping you to connect more deeply with Mother Nature and the wonderful world of truffles and mushrooms. And on today's episode, I'm very happy to announce that we've got James Fever with, the, with us today. Since 2012, James has been the owner of the English Truffle Company, where he not only sells truffles to Michelin star chefs, private individuals and truffle dealers, but he also sells truffle inoculated trees, unique truffle hunting experience days and much more besides. James and his truffles have been featured on Radio 4, BBC News, ITV and a host of newspapers and magazines, including The Guardian, Financial Times, Country File and The Great British Food magazine, just to name a few. He's also been featured on an insider video series titled 21 Jobs You Probably Never Knew Existed, as well as a business insider video all about truffles, which went viral and now has over more than 14 million views. Also, James and his truffles have been used um, on a number of special occasions over the years, including a dinner cooked at the 2020 BAFTA Awards. You can find out more about James at englishtruffles.co.uk and you can follow him on Twitter at English Truffles. James, welcome, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me, Ben. Brilliant to have you on. As, as, as I'm sure is obvious, this is, this is the first um, podcast episode so uh, very excited to get things underway and talk about mushrooms my favorite subject yeah. um james could you start off just by uh sharing with me i'd love to learn exactly how your journey began with with truffles with mushrooms uh and and how you how you got started okay mushrooms came before truffles i picked and eaten wild mushrooms for you know 25 plus years before I went, first went near a truffle, you know, starting like everybody does with the simple ones, the field mushrooms and so on. And um, then going on a few fungus forays, gaining a bit more knowledge um, to eventually thinking, yeah, this is really exciting. You know, lots of books and getting sort of seriously into it and a lot of weekends in autumn out tromping through the woods looking for you know a variety of fungi but not just to eat yes you know that's the initial interest but they're just so fascinating um they can do so much with humans um you know as we're sort of learning at the moment um i won't go off at a tangent into that but you know there's a lot of a lot of benefits of them um anyway the the big moment on the truffle front was getting made redundant from a big company and while looking for a job, I wanted something else to do, something sort of to occupy my time. Um, and I got a dog and I knew from local newspaper reports that a pub not too far away from where I was living was jumping up and down about these huge numbers of truffles that somebody was finding, you know, somewhere obviously they don't tell you where. Um, and it sort of got my interest. And so went online found a lady that um, offered truffle dog training, went to her with my black lab, six-year-old at the time, and um, spent two hours in her company with a bottle of truffle oil. And at the end, she said, well, your dog took to that like a duck to water. So we, we um, and she said, you know, we're hosting the UK's first truffle hunting championships in three months time. Do you want to participate? And the little voice that I swear with was the dog said, yes. Um, you know, do you fancy going over to the Olympics now, you know, a couple of days notice to go in the ski jumping? Um, you know, we went home with a bottle of truffle oil and we did a lot of training, you know, in between, you know, filling out CVs and application forms. And the pinnacle of the training was other half hiding bits of potato around a root and then we'd have to go around and find them all. And we did OK. Anyway, we turned up this championships and immediately I saw there were three television crews. I thought, oh, my God, what have you done? Um, but to cut the story short, we won it. Um, you know, within three months of first being near truffle oil um, and including one of the um, rounds, there was a real truffle hidden on a course and blinking heck, insert own expletive. Um, she could do it. She could find a real truffle. You know, oh, my goodness, what a moment to do it. You know, we, we went off, we were looking and we were failing because to quote somebody, to be a successful truffle hunting team, the dog is the nose and you're the brains. 
and the nose bit of the operation was working perfectly, but the brains bit, me, was left in the side down. It's about, you know, understanding their biology, understanding the relationship with trees, what trees, about soils, um, the various sort of signs that you need to understand sort of, you know, to sort of go to the right places and to find them. Um, but we worked on that. Um, I moved down to a job in Dorset where I'm still living. And um, the lady that run the championship, she moved down um, not a million miles away and she phoned me up one day. Sorry, it's a long story. Um, and um, said, I've got a new site not too far from you. Do you want to come? Silly question. Um, you know, tell me where. Um, and if she gave is, me. To sorry, this is the same lady that dog that yeah. who you got dog training yeah, from. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, she gave me directions, which I followed to the letter. And I was expecting, you know, a woodland out in the sticks, you know, rolling downland etc but I found myself parked out aside a school somewhere and that's as much as I'm telling you yeah. and um, one of the television crews was CBBC Children's BBC and they'd made a documentary on a 12 year old girl following her through her training and sort of at the championships so more children in the land than adults knew we have truffles in this country and they knew what a truffle looked like. So you've guessed what happened at the school. They had a nature day. Um, you know, they were wandering around the school grounds looking for different things. And, oh, what are these black lumps poking up through the ground underneath these trees? Miss, miss, they're truffles. This is my, you know, interpretation of what happened. But the long and short is um, the school grounds have many truffles in. And with this lady, I went there. And I think on that day, we got a kilo of truffles. Um, out of the woods there wow. and um, the school got another fact check and they have a remarkable library with a unique funding source that is incredible so yeah so we we now knew a bit more about where to go and where to look and you know that pivotal moment when we found our own first wild one you grin like a cheshire cat for a week you know euphoria you have achieved what you tried to do um you bond more with the dog the dog is your best friend anyway but when you're you know your buddy your work colleague um the relationship is greater um breathes um so from there i knew my job in dorset was a fixed term contract and i wouldn't find anything in my technical field in dorset afterwards so I turned hobbies into part-time businesses, evenings, weekends, and um, it grew from there. The job finished and going to work was getting in the way of doing my own thing. So I had, I had something else and had the truffles. And, um, you know, we're 10 years later um, now, or, you know, a good number of years of that, working on it full time plus the evenings. And, um, yeah, that's where we are. So a long story, but a, a fun one. Yeah, no, I, I just want to unpick a couple of things in there. So sure. um, I want to come back into the later part of the story, but just to go back to mm. the beginning of, you said you were looking for mushrooms and interested in them, I think you said 20, 25 years before maybe the truffle side of things come in. Yeah. What was it that led you to be inspired to even look, start looking for mushrooms in the first place and go out there? What, did you um, have role models? Child, or, or? Childhood, um, I did sort of simple foraging with my mother when I was you know, knee high, um, you know, making elderflower drinks, you know, picking various berries, nuts. Um, I don't think we were out near any fungi, but we did do a few seaweeds. Um, Richard Maybe's um, work Food for Free sort of came out in the 70s. And, um, you know, that's still today one of the great foraging books. And you know, that, that was inspiring. You know, I actually still have that copy in its lovely dust jacket and it has got truffles in it but you know I, I didn't didn't know that notice that at the time so that was sort of the first foraging and um you know I, I foraged various things including the wild mushrooms the wild mushrooms sort of was the the more exciting bit yes nettles wild garlic etc I still eat today and still enjoy and um yeah I think I think you know we just found more and wanted to know more so hence sort of starting to go on people's forays to you know to build up that confidence you know to sort of if you are shown something and what makes it that then you've got that confidence to go out and pick it on your own and take it home for the pot or not as um as the species permits awesome um similar similar to me it sounds like um uh what i was going to ask you I've been fascinated by this UK truffle championship and, and uh, I did that, you know, I looked into it and 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sadly the lady who organised it that's is no correct. longer, yeah, no yeah. longer yeah. with us. Mar- Marion Dean. Dean. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, who I'm you know, forever indebted to. Um, she was one of the people involved in the the revival of truffles in this country. Um, According to the books, the last professional truffle hunter was a guy called Alfred Collins, who lived near Salisbury and hung up his boots in the 1930s. And um, you know, the secrets went to the grave with him and we forgot about it. Um, but a couple of people, um, probably in the, in the 1990s, late 1990s, started selling truffle trees in this country, inoculated trees the funguses on the roots so with a chance of growing tree growing truffles and um they need truffles as the starting point in that so you know oh we've got truffles in this country and so marion worked alongside one of the companies um sort of doing the dog training side um partly for landowners that had planted the trees that then wanted a dog to go and look for for those but yeah so um yeah you know i owe her a great deal and yeah sadly she has passed Yes, um, yeah, it is sad, and uh, I hope one day there might be a revival of the uh, Truffle Dog Championship in the UK here as well. Yeah, it, it's it's you a know. different world now because we have professionals. Um, you know, it was all, all amateur; you know, people just doing it for fun at that time. So I guess you might these days have to sort of have separate categories for um, the professionals and the amateurs. But they were um, forty dogs run by thirty handlers. You know, principally students of Marion Dean and her dog training school um, and a few others as well and um, yeah I still know a few of them those that sort of you know have gone on to sort of you know build truffle businesses um, and so on from it from it. What did um, what did the competition actually entail you said there was so, some multiple rounds of what sort yeah, of things were the, you having to do? The first round um, you had a paddocky area with a fallen tree, some wood trips, um, some young saplings, and under the close scrutiny of a judge, one at a time, you led your dog through the course, and if they smelt truffle, you had to raise your hands. The dog had to sort of communicate to you in some manner, Dad, it smells truffly here, and you put your hand up, and the judge would write something down. So, you know, we walked through it, and, you know, by the fallen log, you know, hand went up, um, you know, in amongst the wood chips, in amongst the trees at particular places. And um, they'd left, you know, little drops of truffle oil at those locations. But then the pinnacle was going into this grassy bit. And she said, it smells truffly here. And um, I bent down and the turf had been cut. And underneath the turf in the hole was a real truffle. So, you know, oh, my God, she can do it. That was that was sort of a moment. And Was um, that one that had been planted or that, that was had been, just... That had been put there oh, for right, the okay. benefit of everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was nicely washed, looking very presentable. Yeah. Um, and after lunch and truffle talks and um, so on, there was another round, um, a, um, an area all probably 30, 40 metres square, and there were lots of um, bits of wood with truffle oil put under sort of hinged bits of turf. And you had three minutes to find as many as you can. So judge says, go, you send your dog. As soon as it indicates, you put your hand up, he stops the clock. You go over, you lift the turf, you remove the piece of wood with truffle oil on it, put a little white flag in so they can find the hole again for, for resetting the course for afterwards. And then you know, back to the start line and you've got the rest of your three minutes. So. We saw dogs getting zero, one and two, dogs going 180 degrees the wrong direction off to the food tent. And um, we got eight and we hadn't seen everybody go. So we didn't know how we'd got on. We thought we'd done OK. Um, so at the end, there was you know, an Oscars style awards ceremony, um, you know, and you know, various prizes for different things. And then, you know, maximum suspense the um, results in reverse order and the winners of the first UK truffle hunting championships are dramatic pause um, James and Bramble so we got a trophy which was a perigord truffle the most valuable black truffle in a perspex cube on a wooden plinth we got a basket we got a truffle digging tool we got sort of whole stories of rosettes for the different rounds and overall and um, being a black Labrador brackets stomach on legs most important to her, a sack of dog food. Yeah. Oh, you can keep the rest. Amazing. As long as I've got food, I'm happy, she said. Yeah. And did that have um, 
uh, sort of any any impact on your decision I guess to pursue this career into truffles and you know was it a bit of a sign from the heavens that oh I just won the 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 career came later um I did see online a little while ago and it's very difficult to find a bit of a BBC interview which I think's now gone off um where you know I was being interviewed at the end for um the local the regional news and um I did clearly say um, you know, they said, you know, do you think they're wonderful things to eat? So I think the financial interest or the financial aspect interests me more. Um, so I'd already got in my head the signs, the, the pound signs. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it was a hobby. It was an interest for quite a while. Um, and, you know, until I got down to um, sort of this job in Dorset. And, um, you know, then I knew I needed a plan because the, the, the job was you know fixed term contract for a number of years and I didn't want to move away from Dorset afterwards so what can I do to you know set things up for when the contract finishes oh I could turn yeah okay I could start finding some more troubles I already found a few but you know I could you know initially they all went to one person who was doing the um, the tree inoculation but then it, it sort of soon spread from that. Awesome and um, I am very curious of how how did it turn into from a hobby to the business you know what what were the sequence of events that happened where you know what what did you make your first sales doing and and how did it progress from there the first sales as i say were to the um one of the people in this country that does the tree inoculation he sells sort of truffle trees and does research um on that um, so he was the first buyer of everything that I found, you know, the odd check for, you know, I don't know, 90 pounds or a hundred, you know, a couple hundred quid, you know, fairly small, and small. He was beer. buying these in order to create more truffle inoculated trees for Correct. his business. Okay. That's, that's exactly it. Yes. And, um, yeah, I think, I think, um, I'd started doing wild food foraging courses as well. You know, the whole raft from you know, shellfish and seaweeds to mushrooms, you know, teaching people and cooking all these things. Um, and I think I did start to advertise truffles for sale on the website that I'd got for that. That was the second business. And um, people started to buy them. And I thought, mm, yeah, OK, yeah, this is a you know, possibility. And it just sort of, you know, event eventually it had its own website and we were just selling the truffles and then you know, other bits came to it you know, to sort of to beef up what we were doing um for example we sort of came up with the idea of a truffle hunting experience day where either people with interest in dogs people interested in food or those with both would come out and have a whole day with us learn all about truffles participate in truffle hunting um, have a nice lunch do some more truffle hunting and then eat the truffle dish at the end of the day and um, I think it was 2012 we did our um, first one of those um, down here in Dorset um, and the first one we was for a group of two and you know all things start small um, now we see you know um, Ooh, we do about a dozen of them per year with you know 15 plus people on so you know it has it has mushroomed uh pun intended <laughs> yeah that's amazing i do you know when i first read that it was possible uh, from, well, from, from your website to have a truffle foraging experience day because i've been on a few foraging courses because mm, um mm, and and sure. i mainly was interested in the plant side of things because i already had a big big obsession about the mushroom side of things and you know yeah. dive very deep into that but i didn't realize you know in the down season there's still a load of plant and, and stuff so i got interested in that and then throughout my searching for that i came across it must have been your website with truffle experience foraging days which as i mentioned has been on my christmas list for a while now um so fingers crossed one day but uh I also, in thinking of what I wanted to speak to you about on this in this call, like there must be a. Um, I, I wondered what your thoughts were on, because obviously with truffle hunting, it comes with it this big secrecy. I mean, I know you've yeah, you've yeah. watched the uh, the truffle hunters movie, and that was a ridiculous insight into into the secrecy that you know these old Italian truffle hunters, um, you know, they wouldn't even tell their their family when they're pretty much you know on their deathbed where their secret spots mm -hmm. are they'd rather go to the grave and take all that knowledge with them so and so it was almost like a 
a surreal thing to hear somebody actually providing a truffle foraging because obviously you're going to be end up giving away certain locations by default to handfuls and handfuls of people and I just wondered what your thoughts are on that and and uh, how does it how does that sit with you and how do you feel about it yeah the the truffle hunting days are done on private locations where there is no public access to them and um, so far touch wood the many many hundreds you know potentially thousands of people now that have been with us are all nice honest people um yes some have got dogs and want to you know they're getting the human education side i said you know the dogs the, the dogs the nose you're the brains they were doing the brain education side and you know i have known a few of them gone on and have found truffles successfully afterwards um so yeah those sites you know are they're not the best sites the sort of the, the you know nowhere's quite always a truffle mine um but you know there are there are places we can get larger quantities so these are you know site reasonable sites you know where our chance of success you know we've had very very few failures over the 10 years or so um but you know we'll find enough to entertain people um with them so yeah you know, you know on those sites i don't mind but yes you're completely right there's secrecy the places where i go for production um where they are sold um you know primarily they are private sites and have an arrangement with the landowner i pay them x per kilo for everything that i find but a few of them are more public um than that um fulfilling the re legal requirements of the land of course um and you know, yes you don't want to meet other truffle hunters on them and i have on occasions in the little lay by a car comes in as i'm going and the person says, I know who you are, and I know exactly what you're doing. And I, I've, I, I'm getting out of the car with my dog to go into the wood, but I say, I've just been in there, so there's no point. But the fact that somebody has driven a, you know, a long way to go to my, my, I say my, I don't own it in any illegal sense, but that is where I go for my truffles. And yeah, you can, you know, you can hear a slightly knocked bit to my voice. Um, you know, get off my land that's my patch go away um you know yes i know even in dorset probably three or four people that either currently or have uh, made some of their living from truffles so you know how many truffle hunters are there in the country i haven't got a clue but um you know i know i know some of the local ones you know on the odd occasion you know one will leave a, a, a note on under your windscreen wiper in jest you know go away this is my spot or something like that <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's you know it's not quite you know Italian ice cream wars you know you know slashing people's tires and and what happens as you say in the truffle hunter um, film um, fantastic film you know if you're in this podcast you should get get to see that film um, yeah on the continent sadly people do put poisoned strychnine laden meat into the woods to kill off competitors dogs um, some of the truffle hunters sort of put um, not a muzzle but you know a thing over on the nose the dog that prevents it from taking food because mm. they have lost dogs to to this um you know touch wood prey we never get to the stage of having such sort of competition um in this country mm. um but you know the potential is there for that so yeah it's a uh, I make more from taking people out than I do from selling truffles. So, you know, I'm very happy to carry on doing that on public sites, oh, sorry, on private sites. Um, and, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, there's a little bit of haze on the encouraging people versus, you know, keeping it all secret. You know, I have friends and colleagues that purely hunt truffles and that's all they do. And, you know, you know, they're out of the public domain you know, my face is in the public domain such as you know on this um you know some of the other outlets media places where i've been um and you know one day somebody else you know will recognize you you know well, excuse me i recognize you for, or, you know from somewhere um go away but uh, mm. yeah oh that's amazing but, um it's a tricky one i think but uh you know you've you've sort of explained it quite well yeah brilliant um thank you for that and uh, whilst I've got you, I thought I'd be cheeky and just ask you a, um, a, a dog training question. 
uh, or basically share with you where I'm up to with Buddy okay, um, sure. and, and just an example of what we did this morning and, and maybe uh, what would you suggest what either we're doing right or doing wrong. But um, the first 12 months of his training, I've mainly focused on just him being a, a great dog, good with all the basic commands, great Correct. with recall, and, um, and that has gone tremendously well. And then more recently, and we've been playing a lot of like find it games, you know, sniff this Perfect. out, whatever it is. And yeah. so when it came to then start, um, you know, hiding truffle scented cotton buds in tin foil is what I did. I saw somebody do that online and thought that's cheap, easy, and I've got everything in the kitchen. And I can do that now. So we've been hiding those around. Um, and I've since switched that out and I've done. I've cut open a little um, hole in a squash ball and put the cotton buds in there with a couple of drops of the truffle oil. And um, I jumped a few steps ahead and went straight into the woods, uh, probably quicker than I should have, but he seemed to be able to cope with it. But this morning, sorry, yesterday, I actually hid these squash balls and buried them maybe uh, three or four centimeters deep and then wanted to come back overnight because I found he's been almost perfect with if i'm if i'm getting him to sit in the woods and and then i'm going to dig uh, hide them in the trees he's sort of looking at me sort of not looking at me i've had him distracted um but if it's and then if i give him the command instantly um you know a few seconds after i've hidden them he's almost perfect at finding them so it makes me think well maybe he's just scenting my hand or the turf so i you know try and do some fake digs but yesterday um for the second time we I did it overnight. So, you know, hoping that the scent permeates up through the ground a little bit more naturally. Um, but he, he struggled a lot more with it and w went over the scent several times. And I'm just wondering, maybe I'm using the wrong delivery vehicle for the, the scent and the ball, or maybe it's just a case of I need to reverse and go back to a more basic step. So I wondered what your thoughts were on that. He did eventually find it, but it was, uh, yeah, you know, I ended up, uh, with Danny's help, we sort of like boxed him in and helped him and said, "Look, okay. search this yeah. area," and he managed to find it. Okay, what you what you've done sounds great. First of all, so you know, congratulate yourself and Buddy on that. Um, yeah, when you start start in a field, a simple environment, a grassy area that's got a lot less distractions, it's a simpler environment for a dog to learn. So you've done the right thing. You don't go to a wood on day one. You don't go to wood on day two. Woods are a long way down the way. You, know, you only go to a wood when you could bet me 10 quid happily that if you and Buddy were looking the other way and I went and hid the truffle scented object, you know, in a tuft of grass, you know, in the bottom of a hedge that he would find it. And only when you do that, you know, we'll do it 10 times. That's 100 quid. So that's getting a bit more serious. Then you go to the woods. Um, I would say vary the object. Um, the object that you're putting your truffle oil in, and truffle oil is a great starting place um, for, for training the dog. It's cheaper. It's um, you know, got a long shelf life, whereas the truffle costs you money. It goes off um, fairly quickly, um, although you can pop in the freezer. Um, the object will have its own smell. So the squash ball, for example, there is a smell of rubber to that. You know, my dogs could find a tennis ball that's been in the hedge for 10 years, you know, sort of just rotting the bottom. It's still got its own scent profile. So you need to vary the object. And when you're getting serious, you want to wash it up, hot water, let it drain, and then never touch it again with your bare hand. So you're not putting your scent. You know, is the dog finding the smell of truffle? Possibly. Or is it finding the smell of rubber? Is it finding your smell, et cetera? You want to eliminate as many of the other variables as you can. Um, going to the woods, um, potentially get somebody else to do it. Um, so your partner, overnight is good. Otherwise the dog is just following your scent. You know, like, you know, you see the Alsatian getting out the back of the van and tracking off after the criminal. They are following the scent of where the the criminal has um, run away um, and this, so that could be what your dog is doing it's following your scent so leaving it overnight or longer um, is also a sensible um, thing to do um, weather conditions do make a lot 
lot of difference. Um, people sort of say when we turn up on a truffle hunting day, um, you know, does it matter if it's raining? Does it matter if it's, you know, um, you know, they say, oh, what a lovely day. And it's one of those bright, frosty, you know, blue skies, winter days, and it's still as anything. Mm. And I uh, say, mm, there's no wind today. Wind is good. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the wind was like on the day you described, but, you know, having, you know, not a howling gale, that's, you know, a bit more complicated for dogs and you don't want a tree falling on your head. But, you know, a bit of, you know, a good level of wind is good. And you work the dog always knowing what the wind is doing. You know, we don't work the same directions through the same wood every time we visit it. How we work depends on what the wind is doing. So using the wind to our advantage with the wind bringing smells to us. So you work at right angles to the wind. Um, so that's sort of always important. So I'm forever, you know, throwing a handful of leaves in the air. Um, you know, if I'm in a field with a younger dog, you know, grabbing a tuft of grass and throwing it in the air to sort of see what the wind is doing. And you sort of, it will change about. So you reorientate yourself so you are working across the wind. But what you're doing is sounds right, you know, swap your containers, etc. about, put it there the night before. Um, some wind is good. Um, and as you sort of did, you know, start on a fairly small area. So, you know, the dog's not searching the whole wood for one object. But, you know, we'll just do this little part of a wood and you know, it's, you know, within the area box by, you know, those six trees or something like that. Um, um, some dogs will run around like a nutcase, um, particularly spaniels, no offence to spaniels. I know Buddy's not a spanielist in the picture, um, but um, they want to work too fast and slowly wins the race. And that may mean that you work the dog on a lead so you are leading the dog around and if they suddenly you know veer off to one side that's um you know you give them benefit of the doubt and you let them go and then you find you know, they've gone up to a tree where another dog's had a pee or something like that or there's some you know badger dung or something exciting um but you know slowly wins the race i, think, I hope but, that helps ben. But yeah the, the the point you last touched on is very bad because buddy does I mean, he's he's a half Vizsla, half Labrador. So the Vizsla in him, I think, is is wanting to shoot off and sprint everywhere. Probably the Labrador as well. But um, the lead, yeah, that's a great idea. And yeah, I think I'll have to put him on lead. And also, I've been jumping up too quickly into into woods just because it's convenient because that's where we go walking every morning. So yeah. I will probably step back to a field. Um, which makes a lot of sense. You can still do the hiding the day before, getting somebody else to put it out. So the hidden ones, there's the two types, um, blinds they call them in the gun dog world. There's the ones where you know where it is, so you went and put it, um, but your body language will actually help tell the dog where it is. You will, oh yeah, yeah, you, you will react in some way subconsciously when the dog is getting near and the dog can pick up on that. It, so the second type further down the road is you don't know where it is. Your partner has put it out. So you are equally blind um, as well as just the dog. And then you're not giving anything away. Um, to quote another animal example, you know, there's been examples of horses that can count. And it's purely the body language of the person reacting that, you know, count to three. And, you know, the, the sort of person reacts in some way until the, the horse neighs three times or something. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, how many dogs have you got at the moment? We we always have two on the go. Um, just you know, dogs and truffle dogs. You know, they are not working a good proportion of the time. They need to fit in with your life. You know, yeah. the amount of exercise you can give them. You know, if you've got other commitments, family, kids, etc. Um, you know, the right breed of dog that gets on with young kids or you know we can't have more in the back of the car you know so um two is always what we do so you know sort of the out as they get older you sort of get a new one on the go and you know so um you know when you know you sadly lose your dog um then you know you've got your next one is already on the case so you know i've got continuity yes you know you do have periods where you've only got one you've got all your eggs in one basket you know that's my living for the next couple of years in that dog um so yeah so um we always try to have two you know so what as soon as we sadly lose one then another one gets replaced so we are on um 
about numbers four and five or something like that currently. Um, and is there anything that now that you've gone through a few truffle dogs and tr through training them, is there anything that you're doing differently now with your with your more recent dogs than you did with the old dogs um, that you think makes a bigger impact to their ability to hunt truffles? Every dog is an individual. They learn things differently. They learn at different speeds. Um, but I've been doing teaching truffle dog training, um, running workshops around the country for you know, seven, eight years or something like that. Um, so you know, we've seen seen a lot of dogs. So um, at the beginning, you know, prior to launching the first one, you know, I did a lot of time studying sort of scent training and methods and approaches. So, you know, I have my, you know, what I apply at a workshop, um, I apply that to my dogs. Um, but, you know, each is different. Each will sort of get bits sooner or quicker or is, you know, more distracted in woods. So, you know, like you said the basic dog training is where you're starting. Do your socialization, go to all manner of environments. You know, you've got a bit of roadside verge you're in, and you know, a fire engine goes past with its siren blaring. You know, if you're working your dog even on lead, you know, you don't want to pull out your hands or something like that. So, as a puppy, experiencing that, you know, experiencing mm. hearing a train go past, um, you know, or every sort of environment is key so you know i'm just illustrating get your normal dog training done but as you said recall is so important um the woods are full of exciting things the pheasants the deer etc um i have sadly heard of truffle dogs running after deer and going across roads um i won't finish the story but um so you know recall is so 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 important on a dog get your basics done first yeah, yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more. I think the only the if I was to sum up all that I did in the beginning was um, all I wanted to do was focus on making him a confident dog, you right. know, in everything that I did. Because if he was a hundred percent confident, then nothing's going to phase him. No other dogs are going to phase him. He's going to just be happy as Larry and go lucky. Apart from yeah. a few a few weeks where he was a little bit of a boisterous teenager, we have to check oh, that. Oh, in, you, you, was... you only had a few weeks. Yeah, hey, well, yeah. Person. Um, yeah, we. My youngest one is at the um, he's at the thug stage, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So we we need to get through this. But yeah, he's a good, he's a good lad. But um, yeah, so it's confidence in the dog and it's fun. So playing games, you know, hide and seek, you know, as you said, mm. you know, with, with bits of food and things like that. Yeah. You know, everything wants to be fun um for you and the dog. You know, it's a special time when you know, the dog is young. They they grow up so quickly. Um, but yeah, you know, in, enjoy your dog. It's your it's your work colleague. So your relationship with it is even you know more so than your pet it's you know that's my buddy you know you spend so much time you and them in the woods you know it's um you know you you get on really really well excellent um what's been one of the biggest challenges or some of the biggest challenges you've had with uh growing your two businesses i guess the hedgerow harvest which i think you shared with me is is no longer in in the runnings and then also english truffles what's been some of the biggest challenges you face as a as a business owner trying to yeah i i had the two initially they were the two hobbies that i turned to living the foraging courses and the truffle business um the you know both went well both grew um you know enjoy them both um foraging courses there's a lot more people out there doing that um mm -hmm. sort of competition um i've the, the growth of income was greater on the truffle side. You know, so after 10 years, you know, if you're going to have two websites, two sets of newsletters, dot, 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 um, you know, I got to the point where um, I decided, you know, there's only so many hours in the day, too many hours were being spent doing work-related things. Um, I decided, you know, I love teaching people mushrooms, um, but... It was, you know, and and the rest of the foraging stuff, and you know, you know I think I was pretty good at it. Um, but something had to give, you know. I wanted more me time um, and family time, you know, you know, um, not 
tucked away at the computer until you know late at night um, i like the flexibility of working for yourself but um so yeah so that that one um sadly went after a decade or so of doing those um i think yeah on the on the truffle side again yeah the growth has been great but it's been a challenge um you know you try new things out some work some don't and it's um you know you could you know when you're when it's young you sort of do go out in all sorts of different directions and try different things um you know for example one time we were buying you know meat along sections of plastic pipe and making um sort of truffle scenting tubes um you know end caps on it and a few holes in it so you know i was in the garage sawing up lengths of plastic pipe and um you know so they said yeah we sold them but you know it just it took time and yeah it's um you know where could you know focus on the the sort of the more rewarding both you know personally rewarding and financially rewarding activities so yeah some some things you know we have tried they're a success but we drop them off yeah some things we tried they didn't work and you know you, you put them to bed and sort of moved on um so it's sort of it's sort of focus um yeah yeah you know we are a virtual one-man band um you know so i do everything from you know washing the truffles to packing them to you know other half takes them to the post office um and does some of my accounts um, which i'm very grateful um but you know you get an email that says you know dear english truffle team you know, can i can you forward this to your marketing manager and, you know, or you, you're, you're talking to him, whatever, you know, it, you know your salesperson, your, you know, your overseas currency person, you're talking to him, you know, that's, <laughs> that's just the nature of one man bands. You know, um, I do all the website sort of stuff as well, because I'm a techie by background. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, there is always lots to do. And it's, you know, that's just the, like, like anything in the world, you know, prior, prioritizing. Um, you alluded to the sort of the seasonal nature of things. Um when I had the foraging courses, we started in March and we carried on through to the end of October, sort of the end, the, you know, the main end of the main mushroom season. Um, truffles, ignoring the dog training, was sort of from you know, August ish, um, sort of through till sort of late January. Um, so, yeah, you then got a little bit of a breather between the two when you could you know, do big project stuff like, you know, revamp a website or change your credit card provider which takes a hell of a lot of unpicking um but yeah since i put that onto bed i'm now getting to the quiet season so i'm yeah, i'm hoping for a quieter year i've still got quite a lot of big background projects and things i need to do um for the truffle business but you know um i'm hoping to put my feet up for a little while <laughs> <laughs> nice um i the, the with the big projects you mentioned there i did what is there anything new that English truffles is looking to grow or expand into, or is it just more of the same? Or what's it's what's getting, it's yeah. largely improvements to stuff that we already do. Um, you know, truffles is environment. You know, foraging is environment. You know, I'm really you know I care enormously about the environment and you know trying to reduce the environmental impact of what we do as a business. So one project that I have delved into about four times and still without success is to try and eliminate all plastic from everything we do or as much as we can. Um, and I've seen some great packaging for truffles because the majority, majority we send out mail order, the majority we send out in small quantities. So you're sending out something the size of a golf ball. Um, any nice thermally insulated packaging um, is not available in that sort of size um and i don't want to buy ten thousand units of it and fill my garage with it so you know it's not a very exciting project but it's something i you know my heart wants to do is just you know to, to sort out some sensible packaging that's you know affordable and um it's you know completely you know if i send a truffle to you it could all go in your curbside recycling and nothing into your you know or very little into your into your sort of landfill bin as well. So it's, it's a dull project, but it takes a lot of research to sort of try and answer it. And I've just realised I've skipped one of these uh, prompts I put no into problem. a bowl, different colour, so I wouldn't forget it at the beginning. <laughs> but I did forget it at the beginning. Uh, big truffle story. What does what does uh, that uh, inspire in you? And what can you share with us about your big truffle story? 
you always want to find the biggest best one um and there you know that happens in the years with more rain so when the holiday makers are moaning that you know the sun's not out and you know so on i'm slightly happy because you know more rain makes bigger truffles um the previous personal best was something like 438 grams um which phew, that sort of size hopefully that's sort of on the camera um probably maybe even a little bit bigger um and that was found on the perfect day which is about four days before christmas um christmas we get a lot of truffle orders and it's all done with military precision planning and we take orders and we close the order book when we've got to a certain amount so it's achievable you know you don't want to promise you know you're going to find 10 million tons of truffles when you're only going to get you know x kilos um so you know we go very carefully and i we we travel hunt from before first light till after first light for two days solid and then we're packing overnight and things are landing on doormats on about the 23rd of december um having been harvested a day or so before um to get them there as fast as possible you know as fresh as possible for christmas and anyway, the day one of those days the truffle gods had done the right thing and on this one site they were prolific and some of the huge and out came this 438 gram one that you know took about three quarters an hour to excavate because there was a root the size of your thumb across the top of it um and you know, we got it out and you know, we came home and you know you sort of you wash them and you sort of you line them up in different weights so you know, you've got you know x number of 30 gram orders x number of 50 gram orders and you sort of you know you you want to sort of try and allocate the right size truffle to the order so you're not you know if they've ordered 50 grams you're not going to give them 150 grams um you know you would cut that one into three as closely as you could so you get the three the three fifty gram orders you know we do tell people there'll be pieces of larger ones or several small ones um you know i got this blinking great truffle and i um denard and um denard do i cut it so i keep it intact you know no restaurant's going to be open on christmas day so you know it's not going to go to the trade and um you know, I am denied for about three hours and I took a knife to it and I cut it into smaller, some smaller pieces. And within five minutes later, the phone went and it was a friend of mine who um, gets a little truffle for Christmas. And he says, I've just spoken to somebody, a celebrity chef, campaigner type person, and he wants it for his wife for Christmas bother is a politer form of um the word that came to my mind um i just cut it into smaller pieces um he's still got a 200 plus gram one what so his wife got something for christmas but not quite as impressive as um as the bigger one so close but yeah that five minutes was all important but uh yeah we then we then managed to beat that a but a couple of years ago um 606 grams i believe wow um which um it did appear on one of the bbc regional news is um where a lady said it was britain's largest truffle not quite um pretty good though um and that we were it, um one of our services is rent a truffle hound where you can hire us to look in your woods or to look in your um your truffle orchard where you're growing truffles um very deliberately and um so it's been paid by the hour so all truffles belong to the landowner and um, we found this thing and it was you know huge um 636 grams is oh i'm guessing um is that on screen yes um, yeah, it, must, it must be that yeah so it was that's a monster truffle um but yeah, i've heard of one or two people yeah. have done bigger ones um but yeah that's so that that was in a truffle orchard so purpose like a cultivated truffle wow yeah yeah Blimey. but not mine as i say sadly but um the 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 owner of it has dined out on that um story many times <laughs> um and where else have you have you have you foraged for truffles only in the uk or have you been yeah only in the uk we have been invited overseas um we've had people from all over the world come on our truffle hunting days um and um one lady was a british expat who's got a chateau in france and she came one of our truffle days said you must come down oh there's a barking dog um you must come down to my chateau where i've got a truffle orchard um busman's holiday i want to forget about truffles when i go on holiday yeah. um as much as i can um 
and we did get a um, Turkish um, hazel grower, the, the person who got the biggest company in um, Turkey, um, probably, um, he invited to fly us out um, to Turkey to go through all his um, hazel orchards to um, see if he got any truffles in there. Um, I did Google him and there was a picture of his wine cave. So not a wine cellar, a wine cave. And I think it had got all the stars in the correct positions they'd be in the night sky as little lights inside this cave um but um i want to put my dogs in the hold of a plane so it didn't happen but yeah. Uh, yeah awesome um what would be basically what every, everywhere where you've found truffles in the uk i guess more on the public land side of things where have you found the most success and what does um what does the woodland look like or what trees are the, I mean, I, I'd have a vague, a decent idea, but um, in your experience, where do you tend to find the most? The, uh, they grow um, in association with a number of trees. Um, for those that don't know, it's what we call a mycorrhiza relationship. Under the ground, the main part of the body of the fungus, what we call the mycelium, microscopic threads, is attached to the roots of the trees, and there's a symbiotic relationship. Um, nutrients and water goes to the trees, and carbon, so carbon capture in the form of carbohydrates and sugars, um, goes back to the fungus in return. Um, their favourite is beech trees, so the best place in my book to head for is beech trees, a beech plantation, um, and truffles want... Um, alkaline, free-draining soil, um, rich in lime, and we find that on chalk and limestone. So beach plantation on chalk um, is probably the best place to um, sort of to head for. Um, so I forgot the beginning part of that question. Excuse me, go on, can you remind it was me? Just the, where's the best place to find them? I mean, following what you just said there, um, I know it needs to be limestone chalk. Well, currently I'm Ascot, so it's not amazing, but I'm quite close to Chiltern uh, Hills or Chiltern Downs. And um, we went there on the weekend. Uh, I think, you know, it's a bit late in the season from the research and, you know, even reading your own articles, a bit too late. But, you know, it's good scouting for uh, next year because I did find some very good um, beach woodland. So I'm glad you said beach. Um, so uh, look forward to when I can get next go there. Um, and a question I had was, um, does it make a difference to how mature these beech or other trees are? Because I've read, I've read that actually, if they're super mature, then actually there's a lower chance of finding yeah. an abundance of truffles. Or we've we've been in plantations, plantations of beech trees where you know truffle growing was never part of the plan. The fact that the truffles are there is just good fortune. An animal has eaten the truffle. It's the reproductive strategies. They smell to attract the animal. And then they, you know, the animal's eaten it, wandered into this bit of woodland and dung. But, you know, we have found in amongst, you know, beech trees of that sort of diameter, you know, to ones that you struggle to hug. Um, yes, you know, you get more when they're younger. And then so they probably declines a bit sort of um, past that as sort of they are getting bigger. But you should still get some truffles there. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's not always the youngest plantations um, where all all locations where we take people on our truffle hunting days. That's Dorset, Dorset, Wiltshire, and Hampshire um, are um, beach plantations, and they're probably um, sort of six, you know forty, sixty, eighty sort of years old. Those plantations. Um, and we do, we do go into some old ones as well as that. But, um, you know, some places we go, you know, it, um, the trees are 20 years old, probably in some younger ones as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, slightly on the younger side is better, but, you know, it's still worth a look even in older ones. And if you were going to recce uh, a new site for your own personal sort of expansion of your spots, secret spots, uh, what would be like? What would be the quick overview of your strategy for that day? Like, would you would you concentrate on a small area and look at it really like well with your dog, or would you sort of go for a larger area and comb it more quickly with your dog? What what would be some of the 
things that you would do if you were looking for someone? I, I would do a hell of a lot of homework before I go. Um, I don't give all my secrets away. No. Um, but I would know on paper, does it tick the box? Or on computer screen, does it tick all of the boxes I've got in my head for what it needs to have? Um, you know, looking at geology would be, you know, one thing I will say. Um, then it would be, I have two days when I go out, I, doing the harvesting days when I'm going to places where I found truffles in quantity on occasions before, and I'll pretty much guarantee I'll find truffles in every wood that I go to. Um, we do have the days where we're doing a wreck, we're just wrecking sites, and we're not after worried how many we take home. So that is, you're in and out quickly. So you just do a couple of random lines, transects through the wood, see what you find. You know, if you find nothing, you know, you might make a note. Oh, you know, it looked okay, but I didn't find anything. It may be you just get there and you just, you know, even don't get out of the car. You know, circumstances are different. Um, to what you, you know, what you predicted, and you can just sort of tell um, botanical clues um, whether it's um, any good or not. Brilliant. Um, I just have a couple of uh, rapid fire questions, really, just sure. to sort of uh, wrap things up a little bit okay. here, and uh, and then I'll give you a chance to share any final words or, or bits of wisdom or any any sort of recommendations that you might have. Um, so. What's your favourite type of truffle species? <laughs> the ones that we sell, brackets, the pan signs attached to, um, we call the autumn truffle um, tuba uncinatum. Um, it was always thought of as a separate species, but um, it has been worked out through DNA and um, you know, genetic studies. It's actually the same as a summer truffle, but... Um, there are differences due to sort of environmental conditions, primarily an autumn truffle spend in the autumn, a summer truffle spend in the summer. An autumn truffle is a better beast. The culinary world makes the distinction, the scientists, scientists don't. Um, so we like an autumn truffle, that's what we sell. It is the best common or, or best more common species of truffle found in this country. Um, it can be trumped by the black truffle, also known as the um, Perigord truffle, the black winter truffle, that's naturally at home in Mediterranean climates. Um, but we know of a number of people, and again, yeah, as you said, there's secrecy in the truffle world. We know of a number of people have grown that truffle, the Perigord, the winter truffle in this country, but that is only grown, so they're not wild found. Mm -hmm. um, we have been to one or two orchards to look for them, as opposed to many orchards with the autumn slash summer truffle. Um, and we haven't found one yet. So I've not seen one. I, you know, I don't go out buying truffles. So you know, I, haven't, I haven't been near a perigord. Um, so, you know, the one that I find, you know, day in, day out when I'm out looking and I sell, you know, quantity of and I take people out and they jump up and down and, you know, I take things off their bucket lists and they, you know, they're very happy, um, is my favourite. Brilliant. Um, and in two or three words or however Sorry, you normally... two or three words. No, no, in two or three words, what does the autumn truffle taste like? How would you describe it? You like people describing a wine, you're putting all sorts of, you know, descriptors on it um and people have different opinions you know earthy is a word that is used nutty is the word used you know but, um i i think you know the closest aroma to it um and you know we, we do this on, on the truffle hunting day um you know everybody have a smell what word can you think of and somebody might say raw beetroot and everybody goes raw beetroot you're right it, it, it does smell very similar to that again it's the earthiness um of it so yeah um there are some naughty people that might say it smells of sex and socks or something like that but um i'll stick with beetroot <laughs> brilliant and i saw on your on your twitter feed uh you had linked to a, an article of uh a, a chap who had found like a 1.7 kilogram white truffle or something something similar to that and I think the story behind it was he didn't sell it. He invited 200 of his local community to have like a slap up truffle based meal. 
uh, which is an amazing story in and of itself. But it leads me on to the question, if you find the largest truffle of your life, do you sell it or do you eat it? I'd sell it. <laughs> yeah. okay. no, no, no shadow of a doubt. Okay, but you know, if you know the, you know, if you give people, you know, ten, fifteen grams, twenty grams of truffle, and you find a six hundred gram one, you need a lot of people to feed that to in a fairly short period. Fresh is best. Eat it as soon as you can. So you know, it would be a big do to get rid of it. So no, sell it, sell that size to a, a restaurant, or sell a small part of it to many restaurants. Yeah. The single best way that you like enjoying eating your truffles? Ooh. Um, simple things are best where you're, you know, it is the ingredient, you're not getting strong flavours from other things. Pretty much if you slice open horizontally um, a British brie or camembert, um, shave or grate the truffle inside it, put the lid back on so it looks a bit like a sandwich, wrap it up in cling film, chuck it in the fridge for a couple of days, and then bring it out, take it out of the cling film, very important, um, wrap it in um, baking foil, silver foil, pop it in the oven until it's soft and gooey, and then eat with crusty bread that you're dunking into the cheesy goo that is going to all end up down your chin as you, as you eat it. That's that's a pretty good way of eating it. Wow, and that that sounds a hell of a lot better than the you know the truffle breeze that you can buy in the delis. You know, doing oh, yeah. it the way that you've just described. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, what book have you most gifted to people? Ooh, I sell a book. Um, so that's probably the answer. I haven't, I haven't given any away. Um, there's a wonderful chap called Gareth Renardon, who's a British expat who lives in New Zealand, tweets profusely about many things um, other than Wordle, um, which is his current favourite. Um, and um, he grows four types of truffle uh, out there in New Zealand, and he's written a book in it called The Truffle Book. Yeah, um, my and first book. <laughs> this is no coincidence, this is no planning. Um, it is at my arm's length, because um, I'm using it at the moment for something I'm writing. Um, and um, it's fairly thin. It's you know, it's good. It's a couple of years old now, and there's been scientific advances, things like that, um, in some things. But very, very good. Um, you know, very accessible. It's you know, it's um, coffee table. It's not overly scientific. Um, so, so that is my my go to truffle book, which is only available via my website um, in the UK. No, nobody else stocks it. Gareth sends them by the box from New Zealand, where we end up paying more on postage than we do for the actual books. Brilliant. I mean, that's the, I must have purchased it through your website then, because that was the first, um, I think it was the first truffle specific book that I got. And he's agreed to be a guest on the show, actually. And oh, brilliant. He, oh, sure. I had a back and forth with him this morning and he sends his regards to you. So, Oh, great. Yeah, no, we, we took him out truffle hunting when he came out. Um, and rather annoyingly, he found a, a bigger, tr the biggest truffle of the day using my dog. <laughs> um, but the one he dug up was the biggest. So yeah, great. I, I shall look forward to seeing the podcast with him. Very much. Awesome. Uh, and 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 finally, what's what's one interesting or uncommon thing about you that most people don't know about? Oh God, I hate this when they you, <laughs> when, you, when I used to, when I used to work um, used to be employed. You'd sometimes have to do that as part of your ice breaking things. Um, oh oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. Any, any other any that. other hobbies other than mushrooms and um, uh, foraging? It's, walking dog walking um you know hike, hiking as you call it you know um you know day day walks in wonderful countryside seeing beautiful landscapes you know appreciating um flora and fauna be it along the coast um or inland in hills um, mountains um that's you know that's my habitat is outdoors not stuck to a computer like i spend the greater part of my life awesome and uh how can people find out more about you uh, if they want to, if they want to get more involved? It's the website, um, englishtruffles.co.uk is where to find us. Yes, we're on Twitter and Instagram to a very slight level. Um, but yeah, the website's the best place to come. Awesome. And do you have any final um, parting thoughts or recommendations for anyone listening to this show as it relates to truffles or mushroom foraging? 
or um, truffle dog training? If you're an eater, give English ones a go. Um, truffle quality is all about freshness. Um, and we go 24 or 48 hours from, gra from ground to table. Um, whereas if you buy a truffle at Borough Market, for example, we have had customers tell us they've been disloyal. They went to Borough Market and they won't go back. Um, sorry, Borough Market, but it's gone little man to bigger man out in another country. It's been then transported, etc. Mm. And, you know, by the time it's, you know, a week plus old, it's lost, you know, the greater part of its aroma and aroma and flavour intrinsically linked. So, um, you know, give the British ones a try, you know, when I do a talk, you know, I say, you know, I was promised to get a t-shirt printed. First thing, number one is, yes, we have truffles in this country. Number two is I don't use a pig. Um, and, you know, people don't know we have truffles in this country um, you know, and are very surprised to learn um, about them. So, yeah, give, give them a try, I would say. Whether you buy them or you try to find them yourself, um, give them a try. Brilliant. Um, there's, 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 there's a million and one more questions I could ask, but obviously conscious of your time, but um, perhaps once we're a bit further down the line, we can invite you back on and dive a bit okay, deeper. Yeah, good pleasure. But, um, but yeah, no, thank you so much, James, for, uh, for uh, your time and for uh, being the first uh, willing participant on Truffle Tales. And uh, I, I think there'll be a lot more to come. And I wish you, I wish you a lot of success in uh, everything that you're doing with English truffles. And if there's anything I can do to to help, then just just let me know. Great. Well, well, good to talk to you. Thanks so much, and good luck, um, you know, with the rest. Um, yeah, I've enjoyed this first one, and I look forward to seeing the other people, including Gareth, and um, see who else you find from the world of truffles and mushrooms. Got, got Melissa. There. Melissa Waddingham's also oh, yeah. agreed. I had some contact oh, with her. Um, I know, you, I know you I, know her. I have to point out, we beat her in the UK Truffle Hunting Championship. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. There's oh, been a co competitive rivalry. Even, even um, that was 2008. So, even 14 years later, there's still competitive rivalry. Yeah, I, I know Melissa. I, I loosely um, I had a chat with her uh, nearly a year ago now. And um, I think even back then, I toyed with the idea of. Um, reintroducing the the uk truffle championships and stuff so i hope that that can be something that you know okay, either yeah. collaboratively or whatever individually we can all do but as you said i didn't think about it we're probably going to need to you know create categories between professionals now and, and amateurs which is a uh, food for thought but yeah. maybe one oh, day well, yeah if if you want to know more on that one definitely talk to me and i can go into it in even more detail great Excellent. All right. Take care, James. And thank you again. Thanks. And good luck with your training and buddy. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. I expected that picture of your first truffle.